Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to sunny summer Tuesday afternoon of Chem 1105 with your host, me, Dr. White. Hi, everyone. Now, a couple things before we go into our lab. If you look at a Blackboard, this morning I put out an announcement. You should have also gotten an email uh, due to feedback from your colleagues, from various students, I have changed my office hours. My new office hours are still Monday and Wednesday night, but they're now from 7 to 8 p.m. instead of from 6 to 7 p.m. You still use the same login as my old office hours. It's just a new time. I think more people will be able to make this new time, which makes it a good thing. So this is the new time. And if you click on the left where it says Chem 1105 Zoom meeting information, I found out it was from last semester. I've updated it. Here's our lecture lab. And here's the office hour again. If you go to Blackboard, and where it says Chem 1105 Zoom meeting information, this will come up and you'll see my new office hours. I don't know why this one's still there. Hold on one second. Well, I fixed that. And this is the new office hours, same login. And that way you can always get help from me. All right. With that, it's lab time. Now, before we start the lab, don't forget, wear gloves. And even though you're only working with water, you should still wear your goggles. So be protected. All right. Today's lab is an interesting lab. I say that about a lot of labs. They are. And today's lab deals with measurement and uncertainty. If you have a measuring cup at home and you're cooking and you're supposed to use one cup of water or oil or whatever, flour, sugar, how accurate is it when you pour it in? Well, that's a good question. And today's lab, we're not going to use a measuring cup. We're going to use scientific equipment, and that's today's lab. Again, just to remind you, let's go back to Blackboard. Let me go to student view. If you go to assignments, you'll see uh, the lab number three. Remember, you should be handing in lab two today. And this is the lab. Remember, with this lab as the lab you're handing in today, you need to include one selfie of you doing one step with the lab or holding up some equipment. I guess the, the department wants to make sure you're not, we call that dry labbing, faking it or getting data from other people. I think that was a problem in the past, and this is how they're solving it, which I have no problem with. I get to see everybody's pretty faces. All right. So today's lab is to determine the uncertainty of measurements with some standard glassware and equipment. and. Here they talk about measuring liquids. Now, as you see here, this is a, called a graduated cylinder. Ta-da! And they're different sizes. This is a 10 milliliter, and this is a 50 milliliter. I've worked with ones that are real big, that are uh, 
2,000 milliliters. This is a tiny one. This is a real tiny one. And they come in all sizes. Now, let me go, as you see here in the picture in figure one, when you put a liquid in there, and the liquid you'll be using is water today, it's not straight across. It forms a, like a letter U, and that's called a meniscus. Now, where do you read this? And let's, uh, warning, warn, oh, hold on. First of all, I didn't open it. Hold on, I have to open up a... Got to close this, open it again. That's the joy of working on Zoom as opposed to in a classroom. All right. Now, warning, I'm going to do some artwork. And unfortunately, none of the artistic skills of my parents, my father was an outstanding wood carver. My mother was a very good amateur artist. And I can't draw worth anything. But so if you want to laugh, go right ahead. Here's a graduated cylinder. And here's the meniscus. And you read right here at the bottom of the U, the meniscus. This is where you would read your uh, value when you're using a graduated cylinder or any other lab measuring device for liquids you'll see where it's a column like that. And here, if you look at this graduated cylinder, notice they have six as a wide line and seven. In between are 10 lines. Each one of those is a 10th of a milliliter. So halfway between six and seven, you see a little larger line and that would be 6.5. Now, any measurement you can measure two number or certain numbers with certainty, and the last number will be uncertain. We learned that about significant figures. Now, with this graduated cylinder you see there, if the U part was exactly on that line right here, I would call that 6.50. Again, each one of these lines is a 0.5 or 0.1. So it'd be one, two, three, four, five. And if it was right on that line, it would be 6.50. Now this one, the U, if I look at it, and let me make it even larger. Let's see, hold on one sec. You'll see, I'll, well, for this discussion, let's say the bottom of that U is right on that line. Essentially it is. and so it's six and then up seven, so it'd be 6.7. And because it's right on that line, I'd call it 6.70. Now, if it's between the two lines, and generally you're just gonna see halfway, I'd call it 6.75 as opposed to 6.70. And that's how you use a graduated cylinder. Now, in the larger one, you have the markings. I don't know if you can see it that well. Let's see. The markings here, each one of these is one milliliter. So if you notice 40, 50, there are 10 of these in between. This larger one right there, oh, I, got I forgot to, don't look, I forgot to polish my nails. <laughs> I don't. But anyways, that was an awful joke, I'm sorry. But anyways, this would be 40, 41, 2, 3, 4, 45. Now, if it's right on the line here, I call it 45.0. If it's halfway between 45 and 46, I call it 45.5. And you can get three significant figures out of either one of these, and you should for the lab. Now, while I have you on the, uh, hold on. 
why this is thirsty work. Why well, have you a uh, full screen? This is the balance you're going to be using. It's a good balance. You got your money's worth with this kit. Now on here, there's an on off switch. By the way, you got to put the batteries in the back. And if you push it like this, it's got to be on a hard surface on a way to takes about a minute, less than that. And see how it says, well, now I'm touching it. If I, I don't know if it will work like this. It should read 0.00, .00 when it's on a solid surface. Now over here on this side, there's a button called tear. T-A-R. I don't know. One of these days, I keep on forgetting to look on the internet why they call zero the balance tear. I'll have to look it up. Now I'm really wondering why. So tonight I might look it up. And you zero it. You're not going to see it zero here by pushing the button. Now, there's an important thing. When you turn on the balance and you get it to zero, you should see, see where up here you have the letter G. That's for grams. If it's not G, you push this button until you see the letter G. If I push it again, you'll see now it says OZ for ounces. There are a lot of different ways. But it should go to G, but make sure it's in G. So let's review this, because otherwise you're going to have problems with this lab. One, don't forget to put the batteries in here. And I think you all know how to put in batteries. If not, come to my office hour. Next, the button here says on, off. Click it on. It's going to read 888 like that. And it takes a few seconds till it zeroes. It's a zero. Next, make sure there's a letter G here. If not, push the mode button until you see the letter G. And when you're going to start before you weigh something like this, you always zero it. Some balance it instead of tear, it says zero. And you push down and you should see 0, 0.00. Now, I'm going to put this on here. You can't see it, but it now reads 10.76. When you're recording numbers, put all the numbers you see on the screen here. It's not that because I took this off. And that would be four significant figures. So you learn about those from Dr. White. All right, so now you know how to use the balance, which you'll need. I'm going to turn mine off for now. It's got a nice little protective color cover. By the way, to take it off, hold your nail right there and just lift up and it comes right off. I'll do it again, slow motion. Nail right there, fingernail, pull up. And they also have instructions right here, which I haven't read because I know how to use the balance. When you're done, make sure you turn it off. Otherwise, you're going to have to buy new batteries for later in the semester. All right, let's go through today's lab. Now, there's always uncertainty, and you've learned about actors. I'll let you read most of this. Now, there's different types of errors. And they talk about relative error and percent error. And I've always thought they were similar, but you learn something new. And they talk about random error also that's involved in the uncertainty of your measurements. And they show you how to do a measured value using this type of uh, calculation. We won't. Now, they talk about significant figures since I've already done that. I'll let you reread this on your own. And when you take a measurement on certain equipment, you'll see, I don't know about here, 
I haven't looked, but certain measuring equipment, they'll say plus or minus something like this is 0 0.2 milliliters. And that's the error you would have when you'd make a measurement. Now, you're gonna be using the following equipment, your scale, 10 milliliter graduate, 50, I couldn't find my Erlenmeyer flask, 250 beaker, pass the plastic cups. And don't forget in this tube, you have a nice thermometer. For our, our thermometers in science, you don't have to shake it down. Now, even though mine has an anti-roll, that's what this piece is right here. When you're putting it down on a surface, I'd have a paper towel there too. And all you have to do is stick it in to what you're trying to read and read the temperature. And this, you should be able to get the three significant figures. Now, let's go through the activity. First of all, you'll turn your balance on and zero it, and you'll have two plastic cups. Ta-da! And what you'll do is take, and you can label them. I don't have my, where'd my grease pencil go? Well, anyways, with the grease pencil one and two. And what you'll do is place first cup on the balance and record it and remove it and let it stabilize or I would just tear it again. And then with the cup one, you'll take it and do steps three and four. Put it on there, record the uh, weight. You'll take cup one, you'll weigh it twice, and then you'll do the same thing with cup number two. Oh, for um, step five, I guess for this, they want you to weigh this four times or a couple of times, and then you'll put the data in your table. And then they show here how you find the deviation from average, average cup, mass of the cup in a trial. And this will be your deviation. Then uncertainty, oh wait, and that will be the deviation. So let's look at the lab. Here's the lab report. And you'll have, for cup one, they have you do it five times. For all of you who forgot, the average is you add up the five figures or uh, mass of cup one, and you divide by five. And you use the deviation from the average calculation, and you do that, and you do an average for that. Next, you'll do the same thing for cup two. Now, you'll answer all the questions. And for this activity, it's question one. And, ooh, they have the dreaded words. Explain your answer. So. You have to do write a little. I don't expect a whole five pages. This is a small couple of sentences. Two or three should do it. All right, let's go on to activity two. Uh, turn on your balance, stabilize it. One thing, if it's really windy, good balances will jump a little. These are not as accurate as the kind we have in the lab, where we actually have glass doors and to stop and it can, it's surrounded so you won't get any wind. And I've had balances I've used that are so accurate. If somebody walks behind you on the floor, it will cause the balance to change a little. Yours won't. But anyways, you'll weigh the 10 milliliter graduated cylinder. Then you'll pour approximately seven milliliters of water. It doesn't have to be 7.00. You don't have to spend 20 minutes doing that. And then you'll record the volume 
based on this. And then you'll take and you'll weigh it. And then what you'll do is zero the balance. What did I say here? These volumes. All right. I, they go through how to measure, use their graduated cylinder. And then what you'll do is repeat steps one through eight, which you'll use this graduated cylinder. You'll use this beaker, and I don't have it with me. You'll use the Erlmeyer flask. Now they have it up here, this table one. And this is important. You should put approximately seven milliliters of water in the grad 10 milliliter graduated and actually measure the actual amount and weight. For the 50 milliliter graduated cylinder, you'll put in approximately 24 milliliters. You weigh it before, weigh it after. For the Erlmeyer, 17 milliliters. And for this one, which would be interesting, they say 35. I would do 55. You can do 35, but if you change this to 55, it'll make your life a lot easier. All right. And you'll recur, record these in the table here for part two. And you'll do the, like for a 10 milliliter graduated empty, then what's the volume? And then what's the higher mark and the lower between the meniscus? They show you how to do the uncertainty. And then you have the mass of the uh, glassware and water and the mass of the water. What is the mass of the water? That's the glassware and with water. And you subtract the empty glassware weight and that will give you the mass of water. And you do this for these four. And you have to answer question two, and they have the dreaded word, why? So not only name which one is the most precise or highest degree of precision, but what was the reason you picked that one? Now, in part three, it's essentially calculations. And watch closely. Let's do it for, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, when you're doing any one of these, measure the temperature of the water or the room. You should, before you start the lab, I would take a big container, like one of these cups and fill it with water and let it sit for about 10, 15 minutes, and then measure the temperature. And what you'll do from table two here, you'll take the mass of the water for each of these measuring devices, and you'll put that in here. You'll get the current temperature of the water for what you had in your big cup or you before you started it. And then you'll determine the density of water. How do you do that? Let's go back to the lab report. And you have this table too on page nine, I think it is. Let's assume you got a temperature of 20.2. So you come here and you have 20. And then you come over to over here, 0.2, and that density is 0 0.9982. Again, you measure the temperature to water, the three significant figures. And let's assume you had 23.5. You'd find the row here, 23, 
then the column 5.5, 5, and you come down, and the density would be 0 0.9974. And you take that number, and you'll put it in here. You'll use it for all the different ones. They have this grayed out because if you want, you can copy the same number all the way across. Now, how do you calculate the volume of water? Well, you have the density and you have the weight. Oops, cast it up. And here they have volume equals the mass divided by the density. And that's how you have the get the volume. In that table I just showed you from your lab report, you will have the mass of the water. And from the table I just showed you, you could calculate, you could find the density at what temperature your water is. And for each one of those, you'll do the volume. And you can calculate the volume of water. And which one of these is the most accurate by a known standard? And the calculated number will be your standard. That calculated is the most accurate way to calculate by using weight and density, the volume of the water. And you'll look at this number here for each one of these, and you'll come up and look at here what you estimated the volume is and which of the two are closest will give you the accuracy. And with that, we're done. Well, at least we're done talking about the lab. You've got to do it. Now, don't forget, wear goggles, wear gloves, Afterwards, since you're working with water, guess what? You can pour it down the sink. And I would dry off your, let this dry. And I don't know about you, but in my kitchen, I have a rack to put glasses and dishes that I hand wash instead of use my dishwasher and let it dry. Don't forget, put your cover back on the balance. You'll need it later this semester. Shut it off or you're gonna have to buy new batteries. Any questions? And you can always go and come back and look at this video. Is that nice? You can have summer reruns. I just got up and moved the stuff away from my desk. All right, that's the lab. Don't forget, hand in the labs. They're easy points. Don't tell anybody I said that. But if you don't hand them in, they're gonna hurt your grade a lot. I had a couple of students last semester on, on that 1105, and they didn't hand in half the labs. I kept on saying hand in the labs. And their grade drop, one letter grade, one person, two letter grades. And that shouldn't have happened, but there's only so much I can do. All right, let's get back to our class. And let me just close something. All right, yesterday I was talking about, and again, I apologize yesterday, it was a holiday, but I still gave us a lecture. You can watch the video today. I was talking about where are the electrons? And I even said, hint, know this. 
and the electrons are in the electron shell, which is around the nucleus. You should know the center of an atom is the nucleus, which contains, contains the protons and neutrons, and all around it is the electron shell, sometimes called the electron cloud. Just give you an example. If the nucleus was the size of a Chicago and softball, the electron cloud, the shells, would go a mile and a half each direction from me. The nucleus is very dense. The electron cloud or the shells, they call it a cloud too, because it's really empty, like if you were in a cloud. I don't know if you've ever been in a jet when they go through the clouds. I have a couple of times, more than a couple of times. But anyways, the electrons are in the electron shell. They have approximately the same energy and the same distance from the nucleus. I'll never ask these definitions, but I will use these terms so you should know what I'm talking about. And each shell has subshells. And the subshell, the electron in a subshell, contains electrons that have the same energy and are the same distance from the nucleus. Now, yesterday I showed you this table. It even says know it on there. Know this. And that's the shells are shell one, two, three, and four. And this table, shell one is the lowest and always is the lowest energy. As you go down, you go to higher energies. And for this table, table uh, shell four is the highest energy. And why know the energy? Because you always put electrons in their shells starting at the lowest energy first. Now, shell one has one subshell. Shell two has two subshells. Shell three, three. This is really complex. Four has four. Now, in the past, you would have to memorize this. Good news, everybody. If you look at important information, test number one, and this will be the last page of your test, pages. I have the formulas for converting temperature. You don't have to memorize those. And I have these two tables. And notice here, this is the table for shells and the number of shells. And I also have the subshell table. What I don't have is going down is increasing energy. But you got to memorize a little few things. Now, we have the subshells, and they have letter designations, S, P, D, and F. And S is the lowest energy, F is the highest. I will never ask what do the letters stand for, but over the years, a couple of students have asked, what do they stand for? So it's sharp, principle, diffuse, and fundamental. Now, here's another important table. Now, these should be really lowercase, but I'm not going to change it now. But the S subshell, the maximum number of electrons you can put in there is two. The any P subshell, the maximum is six. Any D subshell, the maximum is 10. And F, 14. Now, again, in the past, you would have to memorize this for my test. But good news, that's also an important information test number one. Here's that same table, same number of maximum number of electrons. And I actually should change this to max number of electrons, and I will before you get the test. I just always call this number of electrons, but it really is maximum. All right, now how do we put this together? And I talked about orbitals, all this, which was off. But 
This is important. Electron configuration shows how many electrons an atom has in each of its subshells. Now, listen carefully. A subshell is always named by a number and a letter. I'll say that in slow motion. A subshell is always named by a number and a letter. And for electron configuration, that means you only see numbers and letters. And let's do one more example. Oh, there's my funny artwork. I don't want to see it anymore. Too bad I can't use cursive. I would have been done already. I can write quicker cursive than print, but most of you can't recursive. So the question is three or four points, depending on my mood, each, and there'll be more than one, draw the electron configuration for oxygen. Well, what do you do? Well, first of all, you have to find how many electrons does oxygen have. And you go to your friendly neighborhood periodic table, not Spider-Man, and you look there and say oxygen has chemical symbol O. And the atomic number gives you the number of protons and gives you the number of electrons. So how many electrons does oxygen have? Eight. Now that we know that, we can come back here and oxygen, chemical symbol O, and you don't have to write this down, but the more you put on the paper, the better it is for your grade, has eight electrons. Well, what do we start with? Well, if you look at the table here, Actually, it would have been, hold on, I'm going to do the, should have done this. You see, the first shell is shell one. You always start at the lowest energy. First, and as you go down the ta uh, table, goes down to the highest energy. And so the first shell we're going to put electrons is shell one. It has one subshell. And again, you always start at the table here with the lowest energy. And as you go down to F, it's the highest energy. And so the first subshell is 1s. How many electrons can we put max in 1s2? Well, I'm going to do that because I have eight electrons. So 1s, remember, shell is a subshell is a number and a letter. And the maximum, we show that by up right side superscript up above two electrons. Well, I've got two. I got six more to go. Well, how many subshells does one have? One. Well, I filled it up. So now I have to go to the next subshell. And that's two. And how many subshells does two have? Two. And they are 2s and 2p. Now, s, I can put maximum two electrons, p, six. So let's go back 
And now I go to the next shell, 2 and its first subshell, 2S. Remember, a subshell is a number and a letter. And how many electrons can I put in any sub S subshell? 2. Well, I filled that up. But shell 2 has two subshells. And they are S. And then the next lowest energy after S is P. And P, I can put six electrons in. So I have 2P. I can put a max of six electrons, but we've got two plus two, that's four. Eight minus four means I have four electrons left. So I can put up to six, but I only have to put up four. And there we have the electron configuration for oxygen. 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. I did it right, so I get my three or four points. Yay! Remember, you always fill the lowest shell and its subshells starting at one, then you go to two and three and four. Now, as I mentioned yesterday, when you go to higher uh, atoms, let's see something if I can find a quote. You see this table on the right? This shows how when you go higher, it gets a little messed up and you got to remember these rules. Well, guess what? Remember my gift to you? Remember, shh, don't tell anybody I'm being nice. My gift to you is for my class, you only have to know how to go do electron configurations up to magnesium atomic number 12. And that follows the standard things. You don't have to learn any exceptions. This goes before that, or that goes before this, and makes your life a lot easier. Let's do one more. Let's do magnesium. Now, while we're here, you need to know how many electrons magnesium has. And you should know, I'll give you 10 seconds to figure it out, how many electrons does magnesium have? Chemical symbol Mg, I hope you've learned that. And the answer is 12. Atomic number is 12. Atomic number gives you number of protons and electrons. So we're going to do number B here. Chemical symbol, which you don't have to write down, but I will. And it has 12 electrons. Well, we're going to fill the first shell, one, and one has one subshell. And that lowest energy is 1s. How many electrons can you put in the 1s or any s subshell? And the answer is two. Well, I'm going to do that. Well, I filled that up, and shell one only has one subshell, 1s. If I can only put two electrons, well, I got to go to the next shell. And what is that? Well, that's shell two. And shell two has two subshells, and those are S and P. S, I can put six, two electrons, max, P, any P orbital, six. So I'll go back here, and shell two, and the first subshell is S, and I can put maximum two electrons. I did. 
well, I got 12 and I only do four, so I got a lot more to do. Well, the second subshell in two is 2p. And that I can put maximum of six electrons. And I did. Two plus two plus six is 10 electrons. I still have two more to go. Well, shell two has two subshells, 2s and 2p. I filled it up. What do I do now? Well, I go to shell three. And what's the first subshell in shell three? 3s. And how many electrons max can I put in any s orbital? Uh, as subshell two. So I go to 3s. How many do I have left? Two? Oh, good news. I can put max two there. And for magnesium, the electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2. And that's how you do it. Oh, I better do something subtle. Oop, that's not what I want. Don't you love when I'm subtle? You have no idea what I think is an important knot. You do know this. All right, if I look at the clock, I went a little over where we'd normally take a break. Let's take a five minute break. I can get up and stretch. I will see you in five minutes.
Sorry. Oop. Hold on. Let's. There we are. Let's get it going. Sorry, that was a couple minutes more than five, but you got your money's worth. All right, let's get going. And let's get back to chapter three. Now, if you look at chapter three, And let's get back to where we were. Hold on one second. I got to do something. There we go. For some reason, my bar wasn't disappearing on me like it should. All right. Sorry about that. All right. Now, talked about the electron configuration. And now there's something called the orbital diagram. And this is a statement of how many electrons an uh, atom has in each of its orbitals. And each subshell has orbitals. Orbitals contain two electrons, and therefore S, because you can only do two, has one orbital. P has six, so two, six divided by two is three orbitals, and so on. Well, this is confusing, and for this class, I'd rather spend time later on and other things more important to you, and therefore orbital diagram will not be on any test, or the final exam. So let's move on. Now, switch is full on. By the way, if I had a dial, like volume, that could only go up to 20, I've just turned it up to 100. I stole that from the movie, this is Spinal Tap. But anyways, let me get my Being subtle again, hint, know this. All right, there's something called the valence electrons. And Dr. White loves valence electrons, I really do. What are the valence electrons? You should know the definition. The valence electrons are the electrons in the outermost levels. Another way of saying that they're the outermost electrons of an element. Those are the ones in the very farthest shell from the nucleus and subshell. So valence electrons, the outermost electrons of an element. How do you find them? The group number at the top of the column of the periodic table are equal to the number of valence electron that each element in that column has, have, I guess have. And again, I have here even written it down, know this. So what does that mean? Well, we've got to go to a periodic table. Now, a number of years ago, I found out they weren't teaching Roman numerals in grade school anymore, or high school. How sad. A lot of things they should be teaching. That's my personal opinion, but Anyways, if you look at the periodic table I have there, and above here, I have the the table has the Roman numerals, and I've written in red most of them. I used to add them in black. That I realized students didn't know one A means one, two lines, the second column, I I. A means two, I wrote that in. Now, if we look at hydrogen, it's in the first column. 
How many valence electrons does hydrogen have? One. If we look at the first column, how many valence electrons sodium Na have? One. Oh, let's go over to one of my favorite atoms or elements, carbon. Carbon has a chemical symbol C. If we look at the top, IV is the Roman numeral for four, but most of you don't know that. So I have written both in red and black, four. How many valence electrons does carbon have? Four. Now, I'm gonna let you try one. How many valence electrons does oxygen have? Ooh, I haven't used the pole all day. And vote yes when you're done. How many valence electrons does oxygen have? Remember the number at top tells you how many valence electrons number at top of the column an element has. All right, time's up. Oxygen, and you should know the chemical symbol for oxygen is O, and where it's located in a periodic table. I've only asked you to learn 37. Go on top, see the number six. Oxygen has six valence electrons. Now, let's do another one, because these are fun and important, and that's Cl, chlorine. Oh, I gave it away. How many valence electrons does chlorine have? And let me get the poll ready to relaunch. All right, chlorine, Cl, I gave that away. You look at the top, the number seven, remember Dr. White writes a seven like that with the line through it, the German or European way, and it has seven valence electrons. Let's do one more. Argon, how many valence electrons does argon have? And how do you find that? You find the chemical symbol on the periodic table, argon is AR. You look at the top and see either if you know how to read Roman numerals or the numeric number eight. That means argon has eight valence electrons. And thank you for who's first, Julia, you are right. All right. Let's see. Now, I've just shown you this. Valence electrons, the representative elements in a group, mean everybody in the same column of the periodic table, have the same number of valence electrons. And the number of valence electrons for that column, the representative elements in a group, is the same as the Roman numeral, which most of you can't or the standard numer numerical value on the periodic table, which I will give you. All right, now this is important. The maximum number of valence electrons for any element is eight. You can't have more than eight, period. I'll never ask that on a test. And we've already done our valence electron practice time. Oh, let's do two more. These are fun. And I'd ask you the question, how many valence electrons does lithium have? Your turn.
All right, my turn. Lithium has the chemical symbol Li. It's an alkali metal. When we look at the top of the column, we see the number one. So lithium has one valence electron. Oh, let's do one more. How many valence electrons does potassium have? Your turn. And I see somebody's got the correct answers. Thank you. All right. Question is, how many valence electrons on a test? I could put two or three points. How many valence electrons does potassium have? And you have this periodic table for test one, and you have potassium. The chemical symbol is K. It's an alkali metal right here. We look at the top of the column, and you see the number one. And that also has one valence electron. Remember, all the elements in a column have the same number of valence electrons. In this case, the first column, hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, and so on, have one valence electron. If we go to the second column here, the alkyl and earth metals, magnesium and calcium, strontium, I didn't ask you to learn, SR, Dr. White likes that. I'll tell you later on. We have two valence electrons and so on. Same thing with the halogens. Fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine all have seven valence electrons. Oops, let's get back to chapter three, and it's valence like, oh no, guess what? We have just finished chapter three. Now, what does that mean? I have covered all the material as of now that will be on test number one, which is, a, I believe, a week from this Thursday. Uh, by Thursday or Monday, I'll have posted information about test number one. But what that means is I try and cover a couple of days before, finish the material for a test so you can practice it. Speaking about practice, don't forget tomorrow, I will be going through Appendix A2, A4 problem set. Again, tomorrow, I will be going through Appendix A2, A4 problem set. I would highly recommend you try it before I go through it. And because we finished chapter three today, on Monday, I will go through chapter three problem set. Again, summer is going a little quicker than fall and spring semester. We only have eight weeks instead of 16 to give uh, have lectures like I have. And therefore, keep up. Remember, tomorrow I'll do Appendix A2, A4. Also, tomorrow uh, or on Monday, I'll do Chapter 3 problem set. So keep up, do them. If you can do those problem sets and do them correctly, you'll be all set for test number one. And don't forget, I also have the folder. All this is in Blackboard under content. Let me show you. If you look where it says course information, click on that. There are three folders. The lecture files were in lecture folder. The recommended problem sets were in recommended problem set folder. And the recommended problem set answers you can find in the recommended problem set answer folder. I highly, highly recommend you do the problem sets on your own before you watch me 
Because if you can't do it on your own, you're not going to do it on the test. And this way, if you try it on your own, you have problems. You can always come to class to ask questions. You can always come to my office hours. Remember, they'll now be Monday, Wednesday, 7 to 8 p.m. If you can't make it then and you really need help, email me, and I'll see if we can come up with a time when we're both available on Zoom. But we finished Chapter 3, and you know what that means? It's new chapter time, and that new chapter is Chapter 4. Now, on my syllabus, I have 11. I've decided I'll do 11 later in the semester. We'll cover it, but I'm going to hold off on that. And we're going to go to chapter four. Now, I just said test one covers chapter one, two, three, and appendix A2 and A4. Chapter four will be on test two, and that's coming up down the road. And let's look at chapter four, part one, chemical bonds. And the first thing we'll talk about is the Lewis structure. Sometimes some books call it dots, uh, valence dot structures. I like to give credit to Dr. Lewis who came up with this uh, concept. What is a Lewis structure? It consists of an element symbol with one dot for each valence electrons. I didn't mention earlier, but Lewis uh, valence electrons are only S and P electrons in the difference uh, the outermost subshells of a element. Now, for an element, the Lewis structure always place one electron on each side of the element symbol before putting a second electron on any side. So you can no have no more than two electrons on a side. Let's see how we do this. By the way, I didn't write there, but I'll say, hint, you should know this. Oops, wrong color. Right color. That's spelled wrong. I'm having a, I don't know how to spell anymore. I think it was spelled right. So the question is three points each. Draw the Lewis structure for A, carbon. Well, what do I do? Well, first of all, you should know Lewis structures are for valence electrons. So we first have to find out how many valence electrons does carbon have? Well, how do we do that? We go to our friendly neighborhood periodic table, find carbon, chemical symbol C, and notice on top of the column, you see the number in red or black, four. Carbon has four valence electrons. So we have four, and you don't have to write this down, but I will, four valence electrons. The Lewis structure, you take the chemical symbol, and then you put a dot on each side before you double up for each valence electron. Well, we've got four. So one, two, three, four. 
and I'm done. Now, watch closely. This is wrong. Notice three of the sides have dots, one doesn't, and one side has double two dots before each side has one. In a Lewis structure, you put one dot on each side, a dot is for each valence electron before you double up. And let's look at the same question, draw the Lewis structure for bromine B. And remember, Lewis structure deals with valence electrons. So now I have to go to my friendly periodic table. I know these by heart, but I don't think you do. Bromine, chemical symbol, BR. That's why it's important to learn your chemical symbols. And if we look at the very top, we see the number seven. So bromine has seven valence electrons. And I'll write this down so I don't forget. So I have the chemical symbol, and we put a dot on each side before doubling up. So I have one, two, three, four. Now I'll start doubling up because I got three more to go. Seven minus four equal three. So I'll put one up here. That's five. That's six, that's seven. Now, there are three other ways I can write it. And three sides have two dots and one side has one dot. Another way of drawing it, would be this. Again, three sides have two dots, one side has one, eight of seven valence electrons. And now I'm going to share the fun and let's do nitrogen. Draw the valence, the uh, Lewis structure for nitrogen. So you need to find a number of valence electrons. Here's a periodic table. I'll let you try it and then I'll do it. I'll give you 15 seconds, go, <laughs> go, yeah, right. I'll give you a bonus five seconds. Four and a half, five, all right. Nitrogen chemical symbol is N. And how many valence electrons? Look at the top. You see the number five. And we need that number to draw the Lewis structure for nitrogen. And it has five valence electrons. And I'm going to let you draw it first, and then I will. I'll give you another 10 seconds. We got a clock with a second showing. And let's do it. How do you draw the Lewis structure? Chemical symbol. Then you put a dot on each side for each valence electron before you double up. One, two three, four, 
and then my double up, my fifth one, will be this way. Now, organic chemists, and I'll draw it nicer, write nitrogen this way. But there are three other I could write, and that's one side has two dots, and the other three sides have one. I could just as easily have done this. Oh, that looks funny. Well, I'm an organic chemist. We like drawing it this way, but this would be correct on its test also. And there are other ones I could have drawn. Three sides have one dot, and one side has two dots. Three plus two, five valence electrons. And this is something you should know how to do. Oh, I'm getting lazy. There you go. Anytime I draw three points each or give a problem with points, you should know how to do that. And I'll say that again. Anytime I write a problem and I show how many points it is, you should know how to do that. So that's the valence electrons and how you draw the Lewis structure for an element. Later on, I will teach you how to, excuse me, how to draw the Lewis structure for a molecule. But let's move on. We've done our Lewis practice. Oh, uh, um, I'll let you try argon, and then I'll do it on a problem set. All right. Now, when it comes to compounds, chemical compounds, there are two types. One is ionic. And your book calls the other one molecular. I don't like that. I use covalent. I like that better. Both are correct, but there's ionic and covalent compounds. Now, what are we talking about compounds? We're talking about a molecule. And I'm, I'll never ask on a test, what is a molecule? But I'll use that word a lot the rest of the semester. And a molecule is a group of two or more atoms that function as a unit because the atoms are held tightly together, tightly together. Let's take a look at a molecule. Oops, wrong color. Right color. H2O is a molecule, water. And that's two hydrogens, one oxygen, held together by a force, we'll learn later on, that's called a chemical bond or chemical bonds. And NaCl, sodium fluoride, which you should know the structure of just like water, and you also know that as table salt. But you never thought the salt you put on your french fries or other when you're cooking and putting in food is a chemical. And it's made up of molecules of sodium chloride. And the sodium atom and the chlorine atom are held together by a force you'll learn is called a chemical bond. And there are a lot of other molecules. Oh, let's do one more. NH3 is ammonia, stinky compound, or really powerful. And you've only smelled it dilute in water. I personally have worked with liquid ammonia and ammonia gas that's pure. It's quite dangerous stuff. That one time I had to help supervise because I was asked to ask by a plant manager. I was at his plant doing stuff, helping out, supervising to supervise the unloading of a tank car, thousands of pounds of ammonia, liquid ammonia. And we were all in the hazmat suit 
with a face mask and the air tank on your back. And it was the middle of summer. It was hot, humid, and it was not a fun time. But anyways, these are all molecules, atoms held together in a single unit. Now, what holds those atoms together? Those are the chemical bonds. And I'll never ask what is a chemical bond, but I'll use that term. And those are the attractive forces that hold atoms together in more complex units we call molecules. So if you look back here, the hydrogens and oxygen and water are held together by chemical bonds. The sodium and chlorine and sodium chloride table salt are held together by chemical bonds. And is ammonia too, the nitrogen and hydrogen and ammonia are held together by chemical bonds. Now, not to scare you, but I will touch your skin. The atoms in your skin are held together to make up your skin by, yep, chemical bonds. And what hair I have left in my beard are atoms held together to make up my beard hair or this hair. And those are held together by chemical bonds. Same thing for the atoms in my shirt, which is cotton. Those are held together to make the cotton, which we'll talk about later in the semester. And those are held together by chemical bonds. So the next time you look at something that's a solid, like the wood here, the wall, the paint, the picture from my favorite movie, Forbidden Planet, my flashlights, the molecules that make up those things are atoms held together by, yep, chemical bonds. Now, when we talk about chemical bonds, there's two types. Hold on, I have to be subtle. And the two types are an ionic bond and a covalent bond. So there are two types of chemical bonds, only two types, and that is ionic bonds and covalent bonds. I usually don't ask you to learn definitions, but I hope you all got that hint. Know this. What is an ionic bond? An ionic bond results from the transfer of one or more electrons from one atom or group of atom to another atom or group of atom. So you have an electron being transferred. You should know that an ionic bond results from, and this is important, the transfer of one or more electrons from one atom or group of atoms to another atom or group of atoms. An example of ionic bond molecule with ionic bond is sodium chloride. The sodium and chloride atoms are held together by an ionic bond. And again, you should know, what is an ionic bond? It results from the transfer of one or more electrons from one atom or group of atoms to another atom or group of atoms. And that's how sodium chloride table salt is formed. Now, the other type of chemical bond is the covalent bond. Subtle again, and know this. And the covalent bond 
results from not transfer, but the sharing of one or more pairs of electrons between atoms. Again, the key thing here, the covalent bond results from sharing one or more pairs of electrons between atoms. Hopefully all know pair means two. Again, pair means two. I like my special effects that. Anyways, you should know a covalent bond results from sharing of one or more pairs of electrons between atoms. And in water, the hydrogens and oxygens are held together by covalent bonds. Water, the hydrogens and oxygen are held together in a molecule by covalent bonds. And again, a covalent bond results from, and you should know this, the sharing of one or more, this is important, pairs of electrons between atoms. Remember, pair means two, two. So let's go back and review. Ionic bond results, now this is the transfer of one or more electrons, one or more, I don't know about 10, but one or more electrons from one atom or group of atoms to another atom or group of atoms. The covalent bond, again, ionic transfer one or more electrons from one atom or group of atoms to another atom or group of atoms. And sodium chloride table salt, NaCl, is an example of an ionic bond. The sodium and chloride are held together by ionic bond. Now, the other type of chemical bond is the covalent bond. And this you should also know, too. And this results not from transfer, but from sharing one or more pairs of electrons between atoms. An example of that is water, H2O. The hydrogens and oxygen are held together by sharing one or more pairs of electrons between those each atoms. Now, switches off, but this is something you'll learn about, the octet rule and ions. And the octet rule, which I'll never ask on a test, is in both ionic and covalent compounds, atoms tend to acquire the electron configuration of the nearest noble gas. Oh, what does that mean? Well, it has the same number of electrons as the nearest noble gas. And when we talk about electron configuration, we're talking about, and this is why I think they're important, the same number of valence electrons. And valence electrons, certain arrangements are most stable. They're happy and they do not undergo spontaneous change. And the most stable arrangement, and the switches off for this slide, click here, click, switches off, is N, which is, would be any number one, two, or three, S2 and P6 valence electrons. And that's the same number of valence electrons as the noble gases. Eight electrons, two plus six. Now again, the octet rule, which I'll never ask, in compound formation, and you'll be seeing this the rest of this chapter in the next chapter, or next part of chapter four, Atoms of elements lose, gain, or share electrons in such a way that their electron configuration is identical to the, that of the noble gas nearest to them in the periodic table. When they do have that, they have eight valence electrons, which is why it's called an octet. If you ever heard a music quartet, that means four, 
octet, let's see if I can do it, eight. That's why it's called the octet rule, because compound elements lose, gain, or share electrons that have eight valence electrons, and it makes them very stable and happy. There's nothing better than having happy atoms. But you didn't know atoms have feelings. Now, when a element loses electrons, it forms a positive ion. In ionic bonding or bonding too, I could have used, the transfer of one or more electrons occurs from one atom or group of atoms to another atom or group of atoms. When an element loses one or more electrons, it forms an ion with a positive charge. And this ion is called a cation. I'll never ask you what is a cation, but I'll use that terminology. Speaking about looking at the clock, I just sneaked a peek at the clock. We're just about out of time. So with that, let me remind you, Make sure you hand in labs when they're due, like the one due today. Two, tomorrow I will go through Appendix A2, A4 problem set. On Monday, I will go through Chapter 3 problem set. I highly recommend that you do the problem set before I do. And don't forget, starting tomorrow, I have new office hours on Monday and Wednesday. It'll be from 7 now to 8 p.m. It'll be the same login on Zoom, but just a newer time. And with that, I'm done for today. I think it's a good time to take a break. And with that, I'll say, gang gazun. Goodbye now.